we have a, an interesting thing that we're, we're connected to consumers, but we're, we also have the majority of our, our um, employees, are, they, have, uh, they work in factories and on trucks. And they have earplugs in and goggles on, and you can't communicate with them. They, for safety reasons, they're doing their jobs. So we have to figure out what's the, what's the mix between how do we use uh, social technology for the people who are tweeting all day uh, or people who would never see a tweet. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to turn to Alex and uh, one thing we talked about before that I think is really important is how you had, you hired a dedicated person for social media and uh, you know some companies don't, I, at Pfizer you don't have a, a dedicated person. We did talk, too. You do too. Yep. Right? So talk a little bit about why you decided to do that and I can imagine from a customer service perspective you probably get a lot of people trying to interact with you in social media, but why did you make the decision and how's it worked out? And what I realized is that if we were going to make any real progress, we had to hire somebody who thought about this differently, who was in it, who lived it, who was, um, who knew more than to say Twitter and, you know, kind of wait and see a reaction, but actually used it and, and embraced it. And um, he is the absolute antithesis of a cable executive. He has provided really a voice for us that would, would have been really painful for us to create from within. It was better to hire from outside somebody with some real experience and real perspective. And I guess the message there is, you know, if you're a social media, if that's where you want to be, if that's the space you want to be in, then be in it and live it and own it. Uh, and companies that are worth working for will figure out how to get you ingrained into the corporate culture. Um, because they'll be looking for that outside perspective. They'll be looking for help. Um, I mean, to go somewhere where you're just another cog in the machine to do what they tell you to do isn't particularly exciting nor useful, um, especially when you're trying to get started in social media. So that was kind of my, how we got started. And, and I think the other side of that is that one of the things that's been great, and um, it started with Glenn Britt, who sponsors this series, is that our management didn't know much about social media, but they had a willingness to kind of take risks and take chances. There is no fool for a company that interacts with our 14 million customers in as many times a day, a month, a year as we do, there is no risk-free way to participate in social media. So they embraced the fact that there were risks involved, didn't put, um, didn't make us feel like everything we did was, jo was our jobs were on the line every day, let us make some mistakes, let us learn some things. And I think that's been really healthy for us as we've gotten started, allowed us to take some risks, and it's been worked out well for the company as well, because we've managed to create a presence that feels authentic, that um, provides a service for our customers, and kind of um, lifts the veil on a cable company. I mean, uh, Glenn always says that we're reformed monopolists, which is probably true. Paul. B2B, I mean, I can't tell you how many people will say, why should we be involved in social media? We don't get involved with customers. It's kind of a waste of time. Uh, you know, it's scary. Uh, what is it about a B2B that is different? Let's start with that. And then also, uh, you know, if you could throw in your kryptonite story and how you dealt with that or how, how Ingersoll Rand dealt with that, that's so got to be a must. Session, right? Yeah, I know, I know. So let's start with question uh, A and maybe get to B. Okay. Um, well. In a B2B company, I think the, um, we're a little bit further behind in the maturity curve than maybe a, a B2C company might be. Um, but from the standpoint of my company, Acom, uh, our goal is to, to be the thought leaders within our industry space. Uh, it's on a global perspective as well as across all, <coughs> the, all the capabilities that we, we have to offer. We are a professional services firm, um, primarily focused on engineering, civil, and social infrastructure. Uh, so roads, bridges, waterworks, um, uh, environmental remediation, you name it. If it's, there's engineering related to it, we're touching it. Uh, so our, our own world is working directly with the client and asking them what they're looking for. And usually it's very much of a very close relationship. Um, heretofore, there really hasn't been a need for a, a true social media platform except for the standpoint of that we now know that our competitors are starting to have the same engagements with the same clients in a way that could easily replace us if we don't perform well or if we're not building that relationship online. Also, there are parts of our business that our clients don't know we participate in. 
So for us, it's a matter of taking advantage of all the platforms that make sense. And for us, um, Facebook isn't a platform that makes a lot of sense for us. Uh, it, it's not a place where engineering, the engineering community is going to go for updates about um, what might be happening on, on a project. Uh, but for, for us, Twitter is a very important platform. Uh, LinkedIn is an ex extraordinary platform, uh, particularly as we're trying to communicate our credentials as an organization. Um, it is a little bit scary for our, our company because when you're on a LinkedIn network, all of our excellence is there for the rest of the world to see and people who are in our HR community are a little nervous about cherry picking our talent. Uh, but we do manage that um, pretty carefully. I mean, we, we're fairly confident now that we've got the right people in place that they're going to be invested in our organization and want to stay with us. It wasn't it harder than to convince people you're in charge of reputation and CSR and right. social media. Seems like all three of those would be very difficult in your business. Can you talk just a bit about that? Yeah, we... I mean, we do have 25% um, of our business is federal services, and what that does is provide management support services for forward operating theater uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and places where we don't tell people we're participating. Um, it's just a matter of working with high levels of government to um, help them to manage more of the, the, the back-end support, if you will. Um, we had a number of employees in Libya recently when uh, that revolution started, so for us it was very important for us to get out of Libya as quickly as possible. But what really hit us home was we were doing business in Libya. We were trying to help them build their housing and infrastructure board all the housing for the citizens, they were, they were a huge program related to that. When it was discovered that we actually were participating in that program, we had a lot of um, people through uh, tweets uh, as well as blogs um, coming at us very vociferously, and including protests at our headquarters <coughs> facilities. So we had to make a decision about whether we were going to, be, we were going to engage them. Um, and what we decided was we would engage them individually. We wouldn't go through tweets. To the extent that we could identify who the individual was, we would take it offline as much as possible. Explain our position. Um, it didn't avoid a number of the things that we you know, were said about us, but um, we do believe that we managed it appropriately. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the initial rush to go out there and use social media to communicate your position is something that we took a very hard look at to say, this isn't going to be the best strategy for us. Okay. We'll come back and talk about Ingersoll Rand in a moment. So, Pfizer, number one in social media in your industry, which is, uh, you know, an accolade that I'm sure you're, you're very proud of. Uh, highly regulated industry. Uh, but how do you use social media in your company? You, you don't have a separate person. We, we don't. Talk a little bit more about what you do. So <laughs> if you ask my eight-year-old son, what does daddy do, where does he work, he'll tell you he works for a company that makes medicines for people to get them better. He's eight years old, he gets it. What I'm trying to do through social media and all the other ways we communicate is get other folks to understand what we do. And if I can get my eight-year-old to do it, um, I think I can get others to do it. So our idea early on was watching social media. We're a regulated industry. The FDA tells us what we can and cannot say. So if you're watching TV late at night, you see a Viagra commercial, and you hear 30 seconds about Viagra, and then 60 seconds about all the other stuff. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. The FDA regulates that information, okay? We have to do that. There's no way around it. So as we look at our, the way we communicate with people, we're looking to say, how are you getting your information? How are you getting your details? What do you want to do? Well, I think it's clear to all of us, social media is a channel that everybody wants to be a part of. Health information in particular, you get a prognosis or a medicine, you go to the internet, you check out WebMD, you just put it in Google, and you find out what it's all about. So we started saying to ourselves a couple years ago, we really have no right to decide whether or not we can get engaged in social media or not. The choice is no longer ours. Our end users, the physicians who are prescribing our medicines are using it heavily. We better get engaged in this pretty fast. So we launched a Twitter page um, with no legal approval. <laughs> That's actually true, by the way. Wow. We did it. Um, we didn't think we needed legal approval because we're communications. We are in charge of making sure we get the information out the door. It was the information, particularly the content, that we were being careful about. Then we went to launch a Facebook page. 
found out we actually couldn't get on Facebook from the company. The company had blocked it. You couldn't get access to it. <laughs> That was after the Twitter launch. That was after yeah. Twitter, <laughs> yeah. but that was only 18 months ago, okay? Wow. And in less than 18 months, we went from having nothing <clears throat> to having what I'll call one of the <clears throat> premiers in our industry. Now, I won't even try and compare myself to my colleagues to the right here, particularly the one in the end, these two guys, <laughs> about what you guys are doing, the number of people following you and all the great things you're doing, because it's no comparison. We're regulated, we're heavily regulated, what we do and what we say, but again, you can either sit around and say, well, the FDA hasn't told us anything, so we're not going to do anything. Or we can do what we've done, which is build what we call the foundation of engagement, which is get ourselves up and ready for when the time comes the FDA says, okay, guys, here's what you can do, but you can have to follow up with these 900 words afterwards on social media. I'm just kidding about that part. Yeah. Um, for, so for us, it's all about the engagement. Um, we want to be there. When you ask a question, we want to be there. When you have issues, we want to be there when you have something good to say. And by the way, people do call us all the time and, and email me directly when they, they took one of our medicines and feel good about it. We want to be there for that dialogue and the conversation. Right now, we can't be 100%. We actually are practically half pregnant, frankly, because we're out there, but we're not really there. But we're feeling good about the progress we've made thus far. There's nothing worse than watching a company try and build a social media presence when things are going wrong. And, um, you know, one that comes to mind is BP. Yeah. And just watching them screw the pooch day after day after day because they didn't, you're trying to build the presence at the same time everything is going wrong. And that's no way, that's no way to do it. And mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, engaging early, even if it's not as much as you want, is critical because you want, you want to have a presence because sooner or later you're going to need to rely on some of these platforms. And, and so, you know, but you can't start it when you're in the middle of a crisis. Yep. And um, so, I mean, I think that's critical to, it's going to be critical to your success, is, is not waiting for everything to be perfect before you get out there. I think that's probably the next step for Twitter as far as corporations are concerned is, how do we alert people to the fact that this team is there to help with issues that you're having so that you don't have to go out and say Time Warner Cable sucks before um, you to get a response. That you know through whatever channels that, that this team exists and that when you're having a problem you can tweet at them or you can go on our Facebook page and you can get the, you can get the kind of service that you want. I think a couple of things about that is you know some folks really don't want to be in the social media space. And that's fine. We have you know, a phone organization that, that can handle that. But I think it's critical that we're meeting our customers where they want to have their customer service experience, which is what makes digital so critical for us. Because you know, a, um, a lot of the population now would rather deal with that. I would rather not. I, don't, I try not to call any company that I need to talk to on the phone if I don't have to. I'd rather do it all online. And I think a lot of our customers are like that. So you need to make that easy if it's going to have any chance of success. Mm -hmm. Paul, Kryptonite, uh, one of the, uh, certainly one of the first stories I wrote about in the book and such an interesting thing. We have these Kryptonite locks for our, our bikes and you can take it apart with a big pen, we now find out. And you were there when this happened. Uh, and it's before YouTube. And right. So tell us a little bit about how, how that played out and what you think it would be like today if that story hit. Well, it was interesting because Alex was talking about uh, having a presence out there was so important to be able to manage a crisis when it, when it hits in the social media space. At the time, this was 2005, we did not have any presence whatsoever. We didn't have a blog, and of course Twitter didn't exist. Facebook, I think, was in its infancy if it was still around uh, or, or, or had been established yet. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, a blogger went online with a video that showed him being able to open up a kryptonite bike lock with the end of a big pen. Um, that was uh, rapidly a viral video that went everywhere because within the kryptonite uh, uh, community space, uh, the biker community, uh, cyclist community, um, was very much uh, into the social media presence very early on. They were one of the first groups to actively participate and they were very, very fluent in social media at the time. Um, and they picked up on it right away. And before we even knew what happened, uh, it was all over the internet. Uh, we actually, 
we did the typical corporate thing. We convened the lawyers, we convened the head of the business unit. We said, what do we do now? Well, we're going to issue a press statement, the, the typical holding press statement. Uh, and that's when we realized that the holding press statement is probably an artifact of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. You might think you have the opportunity, but you don't. <coughs> uh, meanwhile, it's, it's just spreading like wildfire. And not only that, but other people are, are duplicating the feat where we thought the first thing was, well, we're going to go back in our labs and see if we can duplicate this. Well, it was happening. And it wasn't just the kryptonite lock. All the manufacturers of tubular, tubular lock cylinders were having the same problem. But because our brand was so powerful, it became associated with a problem for the kryptonite brand. Meanwhile, we had um, brand-related issues that we had to, to determine. Are we going to replace all these locks? Uh, can we actually manufacture them in time for us to be able to do it? We don't have a recall process set up to manage this process, and how much is this going to cost us? Uh, so all those kinds of considerations were going on while all this firestorm was playing out. So within 24 hours, there was no response from the organization anywhere, and um, we were vilified. It, just, it was just a situation where we had no capability to respond. One of my colleagues who actually worked in the business, the kryptonite business, her name is Donna Tosi, and if you don't know her, look her up. She's one of the most, um, she's a fantastic person. She learned uh, baptism of fire around social media. Um, she actually created a blog, a kryptonite blog, where she started to have a dialogue with all these bloggers who were looking for a response. And bless her heart, she had the right personality to be able to manage that conversation in a professional way and to be able to communicate what was going on. And gradually, we found that some of the A-lister bloggers that were out there saying, wait, Donna's doing a good job with this, started to tamp down the, um, the, 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 the vitriol that was associated with the, the issue, gave us a little bit more time to come up with a recall strategy, a response mechanism, in order to back end it from a, a process standpoint. Uh, and from that point forward, Kryptonite obviously built out its blog presence a lot more forcefully. I won't say that Ingersoll Rand as a whole embraced it too much because we still regarded Kryptonite as a consumer-related brand. And we said, oh, that, that's consumer. And it'll never affect an industrial business. And we've had, we had issues subsequent to that where it would have been nice to have had it, but it never reached the same volume of negativity that the mm -hmm. Kryptonite incident. So you can't pick a Kryptonite lock with a big pen anymore, I hope, right? Uh, well, I'm no longer with the business, so I can't, <laughs> <laughs> but my understanding is no. Okay. One last question to you two guys, uh, and the same question, and then I'll open it up to the audience because I'm sure they have lots of things they want to ask you. But uh, the social media versus advertising, <clears throat> and, and I'll start with you because you made a conscious choice, not you personally, but Pepsi made a conscious choice in 2010, no Super Bowl advertising, total social media strategy. You obviously went back on that uh, with the Pepsi brand this year. Yep. And you also have uh, an interesting interactive advertising strategy. We, we do the Super Bowl ads in this room uh, the, the Monday after and uh, delighted in the Doritos ad uh, with the dog and so forth. Talk a little bit about the trade-offs between advertising and social media and where that's going. And then the same for you. I mean, advertising, I think, is perhaps one of the reasons why the pharmaceutical industry is not the most highly rated industry and uh, the number one in the Fortune Most Admired list anymore. I'd be curious to know if you agree with that and what the difference is in social media and advertising. So we'll start with you, go to you, we'll open it up to you guys. Okay, first I'd, I'd back up a little bit and say that four or five years ago, uh, we looked at our portfolio and came up with a, a new strategy that we look at performance with purpose. So we'll deliver sustainable uh, profit to our shareholders by investing in a future that's healthier for people, for our own employees, and for the environment. So with that in mind, you think about our portfolio and you think, you know, soda, chips. Well, we actually have 19 brands that are worth, uh, a that generate a billion dollars of revenue apiece. And our products, we have some in, in the, we call it a fun for you category then a better for you category, and then a good for you category, like Quaker Oats, uh, for instance, and, and uh, is, is one of our products, and Tropicana, orange juice. So we had to step back and say, 
we, you know, we're, we have to protect our corporate reputation, and that's something that we all do. But by, by 2020, we want to be seen as a leader of uh, transformative change for the food and beverage industry. Now, that's a, there's a lot that has to happen between the way we're seen now and the way we want to be seen. Uh, and one way is we decided we're just not going to be a company that sits back and creates products and says, these are, these are our products and you go have them. We decided we would co-create these products with consumers. So we have things like democracy. We make Mountain Dew. Those people in, in Buffalo are probably drink, <laughs> drinking sure. uh, Mountain Dew, <laughs> right, and Pepsi Max. So democracy where we invited the public to say, these are the flavors that we would like. So we actually go off and manufacture flavors that the public tells us about, and we do that through social media. Right? We, uh, we took Gatorade, which was doing very well, but some for the wrong reasons, and we didn't really understand why, why Gatorade wasn't working the way we wanted it to, so we created something called Gatorade Mission Control. So in the middle of the marketing floor in Chicago, there are monitors all over and people checking this stuff, the online conversations 24-7. And, and through that, we were able to see, well, there are different instances when people drink Gatorade. Um, you know, before they work out, while they're working out, and after they work out. That's another one of our products. So the conversations are happening. We might as well, we want to go to where those conversations are happening, and we want to bring them to us as well. You have to give people the freedom to use the tools you're giving them. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you just think about that, the Dorito ad, I mean, you must have thought, will PETA be on our case on Monday? And my guess is they probably were. You know, a dog flying into a glass. <laughs> it sounds like people for the ethical treatment of animals are going to not like that ad the next day, and there's going to be a, a viral response. I mean, do you plan ahead for something like that? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a director of social uh, media. That, that is his job, is to think about uh, how we participate in this space. Um, he's far smarter than I am and more entertaining. Uh, but I don't, uh, we're, we complement each other. And yeah, he thinks ahead of that all the time. And we, we've had our own, Pepsi has had its own share of very, very difficult problems. Uh, long before I ever got there. So we've got a history of knowing how to do rapid response. So what this does is speed up our ability to respond. And yeah, we have to have, we have an entire infrastructure in place of training our employees, setting guidelines for them, so that when something happens, we can get on it like that. Okay. So, I mean... So if we did that, somebody would go to jail. Okay, on our side, because we're regulated. And again, as I said, there's only things we can say and do. That is why you probably notice a lot of the pharmaceutical ads all look exactly alike. Yeah. Because there's Actually, only so many things you can do. Two people in a bathtub, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Listen, I'm not going to kill my competition for this one, but that ad, okay, we don't do it. Next time, look at the next Viagra ad. You yeah. will not see two people in a tub because that's our competition. You also won't see the guy trying to monkey around at the sink and all of a sudden there's like guys are coming out of the sink. <laughs> I'm not sure what that suggests to you all, but it's none of no my idea. business. No idea. Okay. No idea. So we can't do that. Yeah. What we can do, there's a little box that you kind of sit in and this is what you're regulated to do. Because if you do or say anything outside of what you're regulated to say, it's called off-label marketing. And yes, now the FDA will potentially send you to jail along with the DOJ. They are not messing around with the stuff anymore. That creates a bigger challenge for us now because we're saying, well, we want to get involved and have more dialogue and conversation, but you're saying we can only say these things. Okay, we got to figure out how to make this thing work. And so we're using social media, not right now, I would say, in the product space. We do a lot of non-branding work in social media because we, we talk about the products. It has to be, again, within this very tight box. But if you respond to us, we respond to you, and we put you directly in contact with our medical people. And a physician at the company can talk to you about the product. I just can't do it. I gotta have to be very careful because I don't want to be fined or, you know, go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> that year, though, we launched something we call the Maintain Program. What does it mean? You lose your job, you have no health insurance, we'll give you your medicine for free. No questions asked, okay? Personal affidavit, you say I don't have a job, I have no insurance, you're on our medicine, we give it to you for free. Wow. Why do we do that? Because it was the right thing to do. 
How do we promote it? Through social media. In fact, today, the program's still in place, and we're using social media heavily, almost weekly, we're allowing folks to remind them. We're going out through social media channels, through all the NGOs, through all the physician groups, to say, guys, if you have a patient who can't afford their medicine, we'll give it to them. I mean, I can't speak for everybody else. Our hope is that our competition would follow, they didn't. So we're the only one with that, only one with that program in place. My belief is that social media is a great <clears throat> detector of bullshit. So if you're out there with an inauthentic message, you're going to get called out on it right away. So it does prompt some of those hard discussions, which is like, you know, we're, we can't just pass messages. We can't just be about messaging. We have to have a voice, and people have to believe that voice. It has to be authentic, which for us means a couple of things. It means we have to kind of lift the veil on how our business works because it's complex. But we have to acknowledge that our reputation is what it is. We have to poke a little fun at ourselves. We have to have, it has to be clear that we're in this for more than just passaging messages through to people. And our management team understands that. I think one of the issues that we're seeing with social media is that, number one, the marketing, traditional marketing department is being a little bit disenfranchised because they are more oriented towards a message as opposed to a building a community, which is what corporate communications, is, from my perspective, is more oriented to. So we have a, a, a sort of a natural facility for social media that our marketers don't. Now, the second issue is if there is a customer complaint, um, you know, social media is doing a great job of, of extending the brand forward, sort of frontline brand messaging, but if the institutional mechanisms aren't there behind it to support it, then your brand is going to go downhill faster than somebody otherwise would experience. So it, I think there's a there's sort of like social media is getting way out there and the institutional mechanisms just aren't quite keeping up. We're actually looking for more complaints, okay? So there's this thing called adverse event. If you have a problem with medicine, it's, called, it's, it's termed adverse event. And usually you either tell your doctor or you can call the company, call the FDA. We put on all of our social channels a little button that says how to report an adverse event. Supposedly, adverse events were the big barrier to why people on the pharma side and healthcare wouldn't engage in social media. Oh, we'll hear all these adverse events. That is the biggest bunch of crap I have ever heard because, frankly, we actually want that information. It makes us a better company. It makes us understand how our products are doing in the marketplace. What is the role of the internal social media aspects? So we've talked about social media as kind of like a plug-in to your companies, but you haven't really talked about it as per, well, you've touched on it about uh, as it just pervasively covering what you do internally and externally. Um, and is there value in really having that presence internally so that it naturally flows externally? Um, so any thoughts on that? We do have a, a Pepsi collaboration project where it's, it's almost like an internal Facebook uh, community where you see profiles of people and people will say what they're working on so that we can tap into the expertise of anyone in the world in, in real time. Uh, we have, uh, uh, it, it's IBM technology uh, where, you know, we are constantly talking to each other, not even by email, but, but in this environment to share best practices and lift and shift to wherever we need to optimize, you know, that solution. So it's hugely, uh, important for us. One of the things about social media is it's made the, um, the, brand, the impact of your brand so much more critical um, in, as people make buying decisions. And you know, we have 47,000 employees, all of whom ought to be ambassadors for our brand. And I think that um, it's hard for them if you're not communicating well with them. And social media just makes that a lot easier to do when people are um, geographically diversified and um, it, it creates a, a way to communicate meaningfully uh, about what we're all up to and how we can be better at being brand ambassadors for our company. None of us has any control over the message anymore. Uh, we just don't and that's a, that's a new reality and I think that it's a lot more about dialogue than it is about messaging. And in fact, um, you know, we don't even really talk about messaging anymore um, because it feels forced, it feels fabricated. And people, you know, people don't want to hear our message. They, want to, they may want to have a conversation with us, but they don't want to hear, I mean, 
you know, they don't care what we tell them to watch or what services we tell them um, to buy. They want to make those decisions for themselves, and that's what social media enables. So I think in order to be, to truly embrace it, you have to give up the notion of control. If you have a passion for it, and it is a natural extension of the work that you do, then you're going to be a candidate for this type of work. Uh, and the, this, the, I guess the predicate to it is you have to have a pretty good business sense coming into it because there are some dimensions of social media that a communicator coming into the organization 10, 15 years ago would have never had to experience. They would have been writing newsletters, interviewing executives and things like that, but now there are, there are a number of business issues that are instantly hitting all the time and if you're the content curator for your organization, you better have pretty good radar about what's important to be looking for and then posting about and then interpreting for your audiences. You all seem to be in the best kind of position, we were talking about this prior, that the fact that this is discussion is even happening here and now in your program is pretty significant because I can tell you I speak a lot of schools and it's not happening in other schools. So take that for what it's worth. Um, when folks are, are looking to hire, particularly the, the early days, it's what did you do uh, when you were at school? What did you learn? Uh, but as you all know, once you get your foot in the door, it's completely in your hands. If you open up these channels, that you will actually use them. And I think that's something that a lot of companies are not, they want to put their toe in the water, but then they're not really there to ever answer any of your questions. You know, that, that uh, Delta was able to kind of come back and answer quickly and solve the problem is huge and people who are asleep for eight hours before they get back to you, there's a responsibility that comes along with that that is maybe not the same kind of responsibility that you're talking about, but that reflects on how responsible an organization it is overall. One final thought from all of you on the notion of whether social media is a fad, which I don't think it is, but, uh, or is a complete revolution in the way that you do your jobs today. And if you just quickly go through and then we'll We'll say goodbye to our... Not a fad. It's the uh, democratization of information. Uh, it's more of a revolution. Now, I'm, I'm not, my hair's not on fire as I uh, talk about what hair I have left. It's not, uh, it's not on it, but uh, it's, it's a critical space. Whether I don't know where the investment money's going to flow, um, but I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. I just have to look at what the tools are and uh, how to participate in them. Definitely not a fad. I, I would say that I would not hire someone in my shop today who didn't get that this is not a, a fad. And I think that um, the key is transferring the practices from traditional media that work, losing the ones that don't, but, but simply um, pretending that it's going to go away is, is a sure path to disaster. So. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely not a fad. I, I actually, I'm. I'm I'm looking forward to using most of the tools that are available to expand the toolbox of communications channels we have, plus the work that we do on major projects around the world. So much of that impacts communities that we af absolutely have to have those channels to have dialogue with our community members, it, very much impacted by what's, what we're doing to their lives on a daily basis. We have to know how we can change that, how we can improve what we're doing. So. It's a, it's a vital service that we look forward to using. No fad, we look at it as a way, most folks have talked to us today about opening the doors to tell you who we are, how we operate, what makes us different, what you don't know about us. Because again, most folks know the word Pfizer, but you really don't have any idea what we do, I guarantee it. This is a way for us to explain to ourselves, to all you, what we're up to and get questions directly from you. And I can tell you after two years, our CEO of this 110,000, 170 year old company has bought on. So. We're pretty happy about where we're standing right Excellent. now. Excellent. Rod, Alex, Paul, right? Thanks so much for coming up today. Thanks to all of you for Thank coming. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you.